Craig Hewitt, welcome to uh, Open Threads. How you doing, man? Hey, Ryan. Good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to uh, great to finally connect because you, you and I have known each other for for a long time now, and I I'm trying to remember. I don't know if we've ever actually been on a podcast together, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, it's been a hot minute. I think you've been on Rogue Startups, but it's yes, been that's right, like an embarrassingly long amount of like three or four years. Like it's terrible. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I've always been a fan of everything that you do. I've been, I've been a long time customer of Castos, uh, both as the podcast hosting side and, and you guys do all the editing and production for my other podcast, uh, bootstrapped web. And I think we were probably one of your very first clients on that. So, yep. um, yeah, great, great stuff over there. Thank you. Um, yeah. A lot of stuff to uh, to dive into, and by the way, like I've you know you are a, a, a great podcaster. I've been lately actually really getting into following um, Seeking Scale. You know, that's a it's another one of these really good like bootstrapper behind the scenes kind of podcasts. Really enjoying. Yeah, it. that that one's fun. So I do a Seeking Scale with Andy Baldacci. Andy's mm -hmm. like uh, mark marketing non technical founder, kind of like well you used to be, <laughs> but but like <laughs> me and. And yeah, I mean, we talk about we're at similar spots in our business, which is which is cool. Like, you know, how in the whole kind of premise is, you know, zero to one, there's a lot out there. And then like, you know, one to five, kind of how do you, how do you do that? And it's, it's fucking hard. I mean, sorry, I don't know if I can cuss, but like, cuss away. I think, I think we will both tell you like, nothing is easier um, at, at like, decent scale to, to really good scale um, where we're going. And I think that's, that's a, uh, misconception you know everybody thinks oh when i get to you know a million arr or a hundred thousand dollars a month or whatever that like everything sunshine and rainbows and it's basically just all all still really hard um well that so that is a perfect that's like a perfect segue into what i actually want to talk to you about we, we were chatting a bit about this beforehand um i think the theme of this episode here this first one is going to be about failing <laughs> and sharing fails publicly and basically just talking about how hard it is to build a company like this, especially a SaaS. And, you know, I was actually last week I was hanging out, um, with a bunch of our mutual friends, uh, at, at uh, a, a little truck that we call no snow, tiny comp out in Colorado. And, you know, you, you just mentioned how like it, it doesn't get any easier as, as you grow, um, as the company grows and you go year to year. And, and actually a question I was asking a lot of my friends there, and I love to ask this sort of question in general is like, looking back on your current company, can you point to a time that was hard? Like what was the hardest phase of the company? You know, um, I mean, I've been through different phases across different businesses and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of back to the, to the beginning phase of, of a new startup with, with zip message. Uh, most of my circle of friends, including you are, are several years into it, you know, gr grew a, a bit further, you know, much, much further past where I'm at right now. So I like to sort of like share notes like that and just hear about like, is it actually harder now? Or was it harder in like the, you know, when you're around the 10 camera R range or um, yeah. How do you think about that? Yeah. So I think there's like one thing that's important to establish. And I think it's really interesting listening to you and Jordan talk on, on bootstrap web, because that like there's where you are in your business and where you are as a founder and they're not the same thing, you know, like I mm -hmm. think you and I and you and Jordan, are at the same kind of place as like founders and our capacity, right. To, to run a business, even though our businesses are in really different places. And so I think that like, that's, that's not the same thing. Like your MRR is not your kind of capacity as a founder. And that's like good for everyone, <laughs> you know, for like you, you know, you so, personally and I to, constantly have to remind myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I think that like, aside from that, like to answer your question, I think that like, I have been very fortunate both with Podcast Motor before and now with Castos to not have to struggle to get initial product market fit. You know, like you were our first customer at Podcast Motor and we still have our third customer. I think it's so we just like, we had product market fit right out the door. It evolved a lot. It's still evolving. Castos is the same way. We had customers literally on the first day and we were at 10,000 MRR like less than a year later. And, and so like, I never had to struggle with that. And I think if I did a hundred percent, that would be the biggest challenge because you're working and you're working, and you're working and you're at, you know, whatever, not huge growth right off the bat. And you're asking yourself like, what am I doing? What am I missing? Do I have to pivot? And, and I know like, you, you, you know, a lot of people ask themselves these questions 
And, and like, I think that would be really hard. Um, for me, I think where I am right now is the hardest <laughs> because mm. if you grow bootstrapped, it's just really predictable and really slow. We raised a little bit of money joining Tiny Seed. We raised a little more money about a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, and we're coming out of that funded phase, even like mildly funded. You know, we didn't raise a whole ton of money to having to be, boot, you know, self-sufficient bootstrapped. And that like landing is super challenging, especially like in a shitty economy, you know, where nothing is predictable. Raising more money is not an option for most people. Um, and a lot of customers are saying like, Hey, I don't know what's coming around the corner. I'm less likely to buy than before. And so everybody you talk to says like, nothing is going well right now. And, and us trying to make this kind of soft landing, uh, right now is just hard because we think we know where it's going and I have a lot of confidence in it, but I don't know, you know, and, yeah. and like, that's just really, it's really stressful. And it's, it's a hundred percent like the, the challenge of funding, I think is like, you can either be funded and keep raising more money and, and, and the goal of raising money is to get to the next funding round. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a totally different kind of business. And there's being totally bootstrapped where everything is predictable and you're just funding your way. And there's this in between. And the, I think the problem with in between is you're switching, you know, you start bootstrapped mm -hmm. and then you have some funding and then you have to switch back to being bootstrapped at some point. And that is, that's just a, you know, like a mindset shift. It's interesting because you, you and I share a unique thing, um, in our, tr in, in our path through different businesses and that you and I both had a productized service business and then shifted to SaaS. Um, and you still run, you know, the productized service side of, of Castos. Um, yep. and, and I had audience ops and then later sold that, but I, but you know, and, and, and there's another sort of running theme with a lot of the people that I'm talking to on this show is I'm talking to a lot of founders who've who've been through multiple businesses and exits and started again. And, and, you know, one thing that I've definitely experienced, and it seems to be apparent with a lot of others too, is that like, it doesn't just because it's not your first rodeo, it, it doesn't necessarily get easier. And 100%. in a lot of ways it can be harder. I mean, you know, you were talking about how the previous, how Castos productions, it was previously called uh, podcast motor, you know, it, it you know, got customers product market fit right away. And I definitely experienced the same thing with audience ops, um, back in 2015 when I, I mean, it, it crossed 10 K MRR in like literally like three, less than three months. Like it was yeah. like a really fast revenue growth sort of business. And it was like immediate, like first year was like totally clear, totally even surpassed my expectations. Like this is going to be a solid business that I could just run for a little while. Um, and then. I've, I've had like three SaaS attempts since then, which have not yeah. <laughs> nearly grown uh, nearly as fast. I mean, they they did surpass in terms of like number of customers and, and you know, zip message has done better than the previous ones, but like um, it, it is definitely a lot more challenging, you know, uh, and totally different business model and, and all that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But it is, um, uh, you know what you what you also just said about bootstrapped to funding um and that i i find it's the mentality of of switching between those things right um uh i've had multi like the the vast majority of my business career has been completely bootstrapped and and the beginning of of zip message in the last several years has been self-funded through profits from from audience ops um and then and then like you i switched to you know, fund strapping or, or like a, a tiny bit of funding to, to sustain the, the, the initial runway. And it took me a little while to like wrap my head around like, oh, I'm supposed to spend this money. I'm not supposed yeah. to just look at it in the bank and, and hope, and, and, you know, cause I, I think at first it was sort of like, oh, this is just a runway material to, to, to add like a safety net. Um, but then at a certain point it was like, I need to de deploy this and spend more. I'm, I'm curious how, how you, how you've sort of navigated between the bootstrapper mentality and actually having cash to spend ahead of profitability. That's a whole new game, I think. Yeah. So, so it wasn't hard at all for me to spend the money. Um, mm. yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> probably the opposite, right? Like probably spent more too quickly than, than I should have. Um, 
But I mean, for me, it is, if you take investment, you need to spend it. And, and I think you need to spend it as quickly as you can to where it's smart. That That's really hard and subjective. Um, but like, if there's an opportunity to hire salespeople like we did, or bring on a marketing person or run PPC or whatever, there's no sense waiting three or six or 12 months to do that because the market changes and your business needs are different and all this kind of stuff. Like if the, for me, if you raise money and you have a need, spend the money right now, uh, because it could pay off hugely and you could just have more money to spend down the road. So like that, that's how we approached it. And, and for the most part, like it's, it's, it's worked out, but I think that there's a lot of people I know, like in the tiny seed group that that money's still just sitting in their account and they're still a one or two person shop. And, and it's just like, dude, what, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, why did you do this? Yeah. You know, if, I mean, you joined for the community and the support or something like that, that that's cool. But like to give up a chunk of your company and equity, and I don't know how, you know, calm does their, um, does their agreements, but, but like you're giving up a decent chunk of, of your company. And like, if you don't take advantage of the, the things you get for that, and a lot of that is money, um, then, then you shouldn't have done it, I think. Yeah, on Tiny Seed and Com Fund, which, which is what I uh, joined, um, you know, the, the, the community and the mentorship and the other support aspects are nice, but I, I wouldn't have taken the money just for that. I, it was definitely a financial decision, yeah. for sure. You know, yeah. and, and so um, it, it took me like about eight to 10 months of, frankly, not spending aggressively enough it, it, to, to get to a point where I started to understand um, we do need to spend now and spend more than I'm comfortable, than, than I'm, t than I've historically spent like more aggressively faster on people and spend on marketing spend and things like that. Um, because it, what it, what I believe that that buys is like, you're, you're essentially buying your way to faster revenue, gr revenue growth. And once you get there, hopefully quickly enough, that is what ultimately extends your runway to a yep. sustainable path, you know, because yep. if you, if you don't, then you're, you're literally just have a date on the calendar when you're going to run out of money, you know? Um, so you do have to like, that, that's, that's, that's what sort of clicked in my mind was like, be more aggressive for at least a year to two years ahead of profitability to get the revenue to a point where, okay, now we're at break even, and now we can figure out where, how, how much we want to reinvest and, and where we go from there. You know, right. you're, you're at a much better position once you grow the revenue. You know? Yep. Absolutely. I, I think of it as like living in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you've been, uh, again, you've been podcasting for, for many years, uh, especially in these, uh, bootstrapper formatted podcasts where <laughs> I, I always think it's funny how it like, Folks like us like to tune into stuff like that, but the most of the internet is not interested at all. But to us, it's like the best type of show there is, you know, um, because we're being transparent about what, what we're working on and the real challenges behind the scenes and, and you know, just telling the story on, ongoing. Um, so, you know, what you and I were chatting about before, before we hit record on this is sharing fails, <laughs> sharing the, the, tra the, the transparency, um, I mean, talk to, about, talk to me about that. Like, what, what's been on your mind there? Because, you know, I, I do think that our circles and our industry, our little software startup industry, sort of, it does suffer a little bit from too, see, just seeing too much of the highlight reel of, of the wins yeah. from everyone, which can be helpful, can be inspiring. You can learn lessons from what worked for someone else. Maybe you could take a lesson and, and apply in your case. But, um, I, I always find that that what's more educational for me is trying something and failing at it and learning the hard way. Um, so yeah, what, what are you what are you seeing there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, so, so yeah, running you know rogue startups and, and now seeking scale. Um, you've been doing it for seven years. It's amazing, right? Like it's it's just a long time. And in that time, I mean. I never have been the one to talk about MRR and all these kinds of things like super openly. Um, but, but try to abstract away like the lessons I'm learning so that they're one, just not super personal, but also so that everyone else can kind of like benefit from like how it applies to their business. And, and just like, really honestly, like I basically only share the good stuff, <laughs> you know? And, and I think that you probably do too. And Jordan probably does too. And Dave does too on rogue startups because it sucks to 
tell people that you had to lay team members off or that you didn't get funding or that you don't have product market fit and are struggling to get traction. And, and like, I think that it's natural, right? For us, like we do these podcasts because we enjoy talking to our co-hosts and that we hope we provide value to like the community that has given so much back to us. I mean, I think that's really where, where my like podcasting comes from at this point is just like people like Josh Pigford and the folks from Buffer are just so transparent and open and have shared so much about what they know that I've benefited so much from that if I can do some or some version of that, then that's super helpful. Mm -hmm. But it's really disingenuous for me only to talk about the good stuff, you know? Yep. And I say that, and at the same time, I. I don't know that I can share a whole lot of really bad stuff because that's just not yeah. cool. It's just not cool. And so like I sent you a, a message the other day that I have this idea for a place where people can share their fails, you know? Um, and I, I like, I, I should have it better fleshed out <laughs> as we're talking about it on this podcast, but by the time this goes out, so go to failwhale.us, right? Whale like the mammal, right? Failwhale.us. And I want it to be a place where people can share the bad things they've learned, right? Like uh, startups, the rest of it, startups for the rest of us used to have the tagline of like sharing our ex experiences to help you avoid the same mistakes we made. Right. And, and that's, that's really right. yep. like the essence of what, um, of like, I think this could be is not just the good, right. But only the bad basically, because all of the good is everything out there in entrepreneur land, um, on Twitter yep. and whatever. And like, um, I just think there should be like a safe place to do. Sorry. Yeah. Craig's dog is making an appearance on, on open threads today. <laughs> I'll edit this. Uh, and I think there should be like a safe place to, to do the rest. And so whether that's like anonymized or not, or you kind of, again, like abstract away the lesson you learned so that it doesn't totally, you know, defame you and, and your business and, and cast. I was going to say that a person you... in the wrong light, like whatever, but. When you first, uh, you know, sent me the link and sent me the concept a couple weeks ago, um, that was actually my first thought was like, it, is it anonymized? Because I think that is an interesting angle. Um, uh, you know, but may, maybe in some way, you know, because it is really difficult to share fails, like you said, and it's, it's not even so much um, because like I'm necessarily ashamed of it, or I mean, I guess there's probably part of it like that, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but usually, but a lot of the fails are just sensitive information that like technically we can't share. So it, it might be about like firing someone or it might be about, um, I don't know, like, so, like may, maybe something went really wrong that that does affect customers and customers might be listening or something like that. You mm -hmm. know? Like you just don't there or, or team members, right? Might, like yeah, I, or, I think a lot. Yeah, of... or or something that that we that might not even happen, but it's a problem and th those team members might be listening. So there's all sorts of ways that like you just don't want certain information to be out there. Um, so but if it were, if there is some way to to let other founders in on what actually goes on and the and the the nuances of these challenges and how we think about them and how we deal with them you know because you know as you know i, I go to these tiny conferences two three times a year with, with a lot of our mutual friends and that's where the real stuff comes out we're, we're hanging out we're going snowboarding we're, we're doing sessions in a house it's totally private we've known each other for years it's it, we're not sharing it on twitter right so that's that's where the real support stuff comes out, but there is a broader community here online that should benefit from it. And so like my, so here's like a random thought. I don't know where you're going to take fail well, but like if there's some way to, to make it anonymous, but still share enough information about the company, you know? So like, think like, um, uh, like micro acquire where they don't reveal the name of the company on the listing, but yeah. they re reveal enough about it. Like the, the revenue level and the, in the industry that you're in and stuff like that, you know, yeah. um, to give you some context. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, mean, I, I, I don't know, I don't know where it's going to go. Um, if, yeah, I guess folks who are listening, if it's interesting, like hit me up on Twitter DMS, um, the Craig Hewitt on Twitter. Uh, yeah. I'd love to just hear about it because I think that it, it doesn't make any sense for me to just share like what I'm learning, the, the bad stuff that I'm learning, but that every, like if everybody 
or a lot of people could share across a wide range of types of experiences and levels of, you know, kind of company size and that kind of stuff. Like it, it would be really interesting. I mean, I'll just share like the handful of just really broad things that I want to write about, but I'm just scared shitless about like, yeah. um, one, like having to lay people off. That's terrible, right? Had to do it. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. Never, ever, ever want to do it again. Um, a couple of really big, like developer mess ups, right? Like canceling everyone's plan, <laughs> you know, on the live <laughs> database, like things like that. Um, you know, wasting a bunch of money on, on marketing, uh, or sales efforts that probably didn't do enough, like due diligence and planning on, like I, I have, I have so many, and, and I think everybody does too. And it's like probably nodding your head, listening to this thing. Yeah, I could, I could write the same, you know, three or four blog posts. And, and I think that's just the, the point is like, Twitter and blog posts and podcasts are just full of the good stuff. And it's just not helpful because I think especially for like the, the people who have been here and doing it as long as you and I have see that. And they're just like, Oh, I, I heard this one thing that someone said, and I know there's a lot more badness behind that. You know, I know yeah. you said, Oh, we had a rough patch and that means you're shit in the bed and you, <laughs> you have to fire people and you don't know if you're going to make it. Um, but a new entrepreneur who is just starting out, hears that and says, oh, this SaaS stuff is so easy. I just like mm -hmm. cobble together some rails and get some customers and write some blog posts and it's all great. And it is not like, it's really effing hard. And like, that's where I think that these kind of podcasts and, and I run one too, right? So two, you know, so like I'm, I'm as guilty as everyone else, but like this kind of content is dangerous to some people. And I think that like striking that balance is pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I think you're totally right that, um, I, you know, it, it, the more experience that you gain and, and, and the further along your company goes, it's, it's almost like you don't know what you don't even know. Yeah. Right? You don't, you don't, you have people starting out have no idea what kinds of challenges are going to arise. And, and you're right. They can be a lot harder and a lot worse. And I know there's plenty that I haven't even run up into yet, you know, um, uh, and I, and I think it's, you know, folks who listen to bootstrap web or seeking scale, I, I think if, if they're sort of like in our quote unquote generation, <laughs> our, our age mm -hmm. and, and been, yeah. been around, um, been around this, this game a bit, like you could probably tell the, the, like the ballpark of, of what the challenges are that, that we might be talking about but that, and dancing around, but not saying specifically, but you're right. Like there's a lot of younger folks and that's how I generally think about building in public and sharing and going all the way back to my blogging days and email and Twitter and podcasting. I'm always thinking about like, I'm speaking to myself from three years ago, five years ago, you know, where, you know, like I'm speaking to a version of myself where, where I just did not run up into these things yet. Yeah. And if, if I could share that knowledge, that, cause that's how I've always learned is by following folks and, yep. and following their, their story and, and, and seeing, you know, the, the, the different paths that people took and then seeing myself in, in those paths, like, you know, yeah. So uh, I, I wonder how you think about fails though. Cause I I've been asked that question a lot, like on podcasts and stuff where, where they're like, you know, if you could do some, this or that over again, or what were the big biggest mistakes that you've made in your career? And I, I always have a hard time with that question because looking back, I could point to a lot of stuff, but at the same time, I wouldn't have known, like, I, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am now had I not made a bunch of those mistakes. Yeah. And, and also like at the time, looking back, maybe it was the, this was, that was the wrong decision, but like at the time, given, given this, the data that I had in front of me, you know, I, I think I probably made the right decision. It just turned out to be wrong later, but it, but I would, I didn't have the, the necessary insight at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that. Um, I, I have two things that, that this brings to mind. I, I mostly agree with what you're saying. Like you have to have the, the bumps and the bruises to form who you are and your, you know, character, you know, but, but also like knowledge and, and capacity. Um, I think that, um, one thing I really am missing, this is just me really personally is like, again, there's a lot of mentorship and content and stuff at the 10 K a month kind of target audience, but there's 
almost nothing for like one to five million. And, and right. I think there's not because it gets so different so quickly, you know, like to get to 10 K mm -hmm. you do the same thing as everyone else basically. And you should be able to get there. But, but to go from one to 5 million is really different and really nuanced. And so like right now, that's what I'm struggling the most with is like, I need somebody to be able to talk to really in depth, really share all the bad things <laughs> that I'm going through. Uh, and, and like, I don't find that person. And I've asked a whole bunch, I've asked a lot of really connected people and they're, that they just don't exist, I guess. Yeah. So anyways, if somebody knows for, of... for, uh, for like advice or, or stuff like that, like, be, so. You know, yeah, between like communities, mastermind groups, coaches, what do you look to? Yeah, I mean, so, so so we're in a community, you and I are in a community together of, you know, about 20 people. That's one. Um, the tiny seed group is probably my best source of, of like knowledge right now. Um, but what I'm looking for is like, I mean, it's really specific, like a paid community, um, like mastermind plus or minus like individual coaching only for SaaS founders over a million dollars. Mm-hmm. That's, that's not a huge world, but it's not super small either. And like everyone says, Dan Martell, like, I, I don't know, like, I, I like Dan, um, Dan and I are actually talking right now about like working together. Um, but I'm not sure that that's exactly right either. Um, I think there's a lot of people that are in this boat and, and need this kind of thing. Um, so anyways, that, that's like, mm -hmm. that's one, but to answer your question, like, um, I think really specifically, like if I had one thing to do over again, um, in my business, it is that I, I wish that we could charge more money because mm. it is such a massive lever. Um, you know, our ARPU is $29 and if it was 80, like you can just, you know, like, um, Mark from powered by search tweeted the other day, he says like, there's one common thread in high growth companies and it's ARPU. You know, that's totally. so. I, I, I totally relate to that. Zip message is, is in the same challenge right now too. Um, and you know, like, like I said, looking back on the, the business that I was able to grow MRR the fastest was by far the one with the highest ARPU, <laughs> you know, the audience yep. ops was, was in the thousands ARPU. And, um, um, you know, there's, there's definitely trade-offs. I, I thought I found with process kit that we had a bit higher ARPU than, than zip message, but it also required more setup and onboarding and, and activation effort, yep. right. Yep. Um, and switching costs and stuff like that. But, um, we're making a big shift right now with zip message and, and the aim is to increase our ARPU. And, you know, the, the, one of the reasons aside from the customer research and the product market fit kind of stuff I've, I've been working on is I have a spreadsheet where I can, uh, uh, what do you call it? You know, see the next 12 months of forecast. Yeah. Yeah. For, like a forecasting spreadsheet. Right. And I can plug in our current numbers and I can play with, if we increase traffic or if we increase conversion rate, or if, if we increase ARPU or if we increase churn rate, you know, how do all these changes impact and far and away, every time I run the projection, you play with ARPU that, that gets you to the goal the fastest. Yeah. You know? Yep. Um, Joel from buffer had a really interesting like tweet thread and talk about like transparency. They're like the, the poster child for like transparency. Um, and it was, it, it was the downside of chasing this though. It was, they have always been kind of like this, you know, 20 bucks a month, whatever. And they tried to go after the enterprise and just failed, you know, like product and marketing and sales and all these decisions you do to try to go after the higher value customers. And it takes you away from your base that got you to a million or 10 million or whatever it is. And, and I think we've been guilty of that a little bit, um, with, with some of the stuff we've tried to do around like private podcasting, like it's just there, there is, but again, like everything is trade-offs, right? I mean, totally. One thing that I, that I notice about zip message, I'm curious if you see this with podcast hosting is that. I have been genuinely surprised at how low of a pain the support load has been with zip message. I mean, we, this is, this business has literally more customers, including both paid users. And we have thousands of free users on zip message and, and respondent users to those, to, to our customers. We don't get a lot of customer support, like problems, like how to reset my password or like low level 
we we just don't have a high load of that. Um, yeah. We relatively we're still not at a huge volume, but we're at a much higher volume than any of my previous businesses, and those with much fewer customers had a much higher support load than we have. You know, and I think it's like the nature of like we're, we're a lower priced product, which in some ways I think makes it simpler because we're solving a smaller problem that like part of the goal of moving ARPU up is to solve a bigger problem, right? Do, do more. And so it's always a trade-off. I think as you, as you add more complexity, you're going to add more support and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We, we see the same thing. I mean, we have a lot of customers that we've never heard from, you know? Um, yeah. I think, I think the one, the one interesting thing for us there is, you know, we have a WordPress plugin, which is how like the whole business got started is us acquiring the WordPress plugin. And that is where almost all of our support comes from mm -hmm. just because WordPress is, you know, a complicated thing with a lot of variables that we don't control a lot of them. So that that's where a lot of our support comes from is, is that integration in people's bonkers WordPress setups and all the million themes and plugins that, that can yeah. conflict with what we do. But yeah, I mean, I think that's the model, right? Is you can build a bigger company at a lower price point just by having a lot of customers that are very low friction yeah onboarding paying being successful you know all this kind of stuff a, a higher price point 100 percent needs needs more actual people being involved yep it's just yeah trade off yeah i mean just getting back to like this like where we turn to for support um i've i've sort of evolved on that quite a bit and and also recently um uh so you and i are in this like private uh like Slack group and podcast. Um, so we get, and, and that sort of overlaps with some of the folks that I hang out with two or three times a year on these tiny conferences, like 10 or 12 of us. So that, that's that been really key for me because we, I, I've literally been attending these trips and hanging out with them for going on 10 years now, which is pretty amazing. Um, and that's turned into like an annual mastermind with some interaction throughout the year. Um, and then I also have like a, a more traditional mastermind group, like uh, three, three other people and, and myself, we, we meet every two weeks. Um, so that's, that, those are like the main channels that I turn to when I have like a sticky question that I'm dealing with that I'm probably not going to talk about publicly, but I'll talk to, to these people about, um, one other thing that I'm, that I'm beginning to, to turn to more is one-on-one -on -one, and, and I'm also in Confund and I do some mentor calls there, but I'm, I'm not quite as plugged in as I am with, with the, these other groups. Um, I, I do, uh, I think you and I both do these investor update emails, right? Uh, once a month, I, and that's just a good exercise in itself, like writing yep. up. Everyone uh, should do it. The, the monthly recap. And and again, like with going back to those trips, like we each even like present uh, a session, like a slide deck of like the, a recap of the year and some of the big challenges and, and wins and stuff like that. So that, that's a good exercise. But I also find that like sending the, the, monthly update email also triggers more one-to-one -one advising from, from friends. And I, and I find that that can even be even more helpful. So like my direct responses to my investor update email or like DMS with, with friends and advisors, and you're certainly one of them, you know, like, um, that I, I find that's even more helpful, but I think because of the one-to-one -one privacy of it, because I think sometimes in a group setting, the feedback can be influenced there. Sometimes feedback can be a little bit performative, like, mm -hmm. yeah, somebody's Forced. giving me yeah. feedback, but they're also performing in front of these other 20 people on, on what they're going to say in response yeah. to my thing. You yeah. know? Whereas it, when it's private, I do find that like, there's a lot more variance. Like if I ask the same question to five or 10 different people, there's a much wider range of, and probably more detailed feedback I, I find. You know. Yeah. I mean, I, I mostly agree like on the, the investor update email is amazing, right? Even, you know, uh, I, I saw anchor formerly of teachable is starting a new thing and he's like, I don't have investors, but I'm still sending a monthly email. Like if, let me know if you want to be in that, like, that's amazing. I think everyone should do it. Um, Ed Frey Fogel, one of our you know friends and investors turned me onto this like a long time ago and it's, it's great. It's super helpful. It makes me think critically about, about what we do. Um, and I, I agree that like getting feedback from those folks is good. The problem I have with it is it's inconsistent, you know, like yeah. I'll go three months without hearing from anyone. And then 
you know, one person responds this month and next month, one other person might respond and stuff like that. So like, yes, it's helpful, but it's totally ad hoc. And I think, I think just for me, like, yeah, I mean, that thing I'm missing is a person to talk to every two weeks because like, I mean, this sounds conceited, but like, I don't do a mastermind because I don't think that many of my friends have a lot to teach me at this point, you know? Yep. That yeah, sounds I mean, really I've, I've conceited coming out of my mouth, but like, I want to learn no, dude, I... from the guy who sold for 25 million. And that's basically the only person I want to learn from, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I get it, you know? And, um, for, for me, like in, in a lot of these groups that, that we hang out with in person, mo most of our mutual friends are way ahead, years ahead in, in, uh, in business or company level. Um, so I still get that like future experience. In, in that yeah. Sense, but, but... And it's that, but it's also like, they have a like N of one, like they have an experience set of one, whereas like a professional right. coach has an experience set of like you talk to Rob Walling and he's an investor in 120 companies. Like he has seen so much shit in the last, you know, yeah. seven or eight years that like his perspective is so much better than any other individual person running a single business. Um, so anyways, that's, that, that's, and, and you're right though, because that's like, point. If, if they don't offer like a paid coaching service, then they're doing it because they're, or if they're not invested in your company, then they're doing it because they're nice. Maybe they like to talk to you. Yeah. And that's but great. They don't necessarily, but they don't necessarily have the time or the, to, to invest every week for a long period of time, because that's where you, you can really go deep with someone, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally get it. Well, you know, I think like most uh, episodes here, we it's it's one of those things where we have way more questions than answers. Um, but I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna mark it here, and uh, we'll we'll come back for another one. Sounds good.